get comfy. Are you, you just gonna sit there? Oh, hi. Oh, hello. Hey folks, it's Brittany here from Patrick Pan Apparel. So today I'm gonna be talking to you about the fashion group which was a group started in the late 20s, early 30s of female professionals in the fashion industry. And the reason that it makes me so emotional is just that these are... Um, there's some incredible stories of some really amazing women who would have had to fight through a lot and deal with a lot to progress in their careers and never really ever received the um, never really received the attention, the acclaim that they would do. Um, so it just women are just amazing. And these these women in particular that we're gonna talk about today just blow my mind. Um, so I love learning about them. They make me feel empowered. Uh, if they were able to go through the things they did, then, you know, I feel like I can go through what I'm going through today. So, um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the fashion group. So the fashion group was first kind of brought together in 1928. The idea for the fashion group was allegedly brought up by Edna Woolman Chase who was the editor of Vogue. Um, she was the editor of Vogue between 1914 and 1952 and there was a group of 17 women a group of 17 women that met together to discuss their ideas for the group for a little bit of context in 1928 and in the early 30s so the group was officially formed i think in 1930 or 1931 and at this time uh the united states was going through the great depression so there was this big shift in clothing manufacturing to make clothing cheaper and a big new shift in kind of marketing to try to convince people to continue buying clothing. So the goal of the group was to professionalize women's roles in the industry and to uh, promote fashion as a viable career for women and just generally to uh, support the idea that fashion as an industry should be taken seriously. Because throughout all of history, fashion and clothing has always been one of the largest the largest industries. It's, all, it's always been around. We've always been wearing clothes. And at this time in the late 20s, early 30s, fashion was really one of the only industries where women could actually reach prominent positions within the industry. But there were a few issues that were quite specific to women in the fashion industry that kind of prevented them being taken seriously more broadly. So one of them is the idea that fashion Women were good at fashion because it was innate, because they were female, and that it did not involve any special skills, any um, acquired skills, which really undermined women as workers, even though we know that fashion is so multifaceted, um, whether it's designing, marketing, selling, that you can't really say that it is just something innate, that you're a woman so you can work in fashion, or beauty as well. And that on top of that, if you were in a high position in one of these feminine industries, it was even more difficult still to be taken seriously within that industry. Now, the fashion group was not specifically a feminist industry. <sighs> oh, it is a, uh, a rainy day here in Brisbane, and I wish that I could say it was cozy rainy day and I was snuggled up with a cup of coffee, but it is a hot and humid rainy day and this is actually an iced coffee to try to keep me cool. Oh, you can see how shiny I am. It's hot. It's so hot. I think I've complained about the heat in every single one of my videos that I've made so far. <laughs> so even though the fashion group did not claim to be a feminist industry because during this time in the early 30s, it was a little bit of a tumultuous period for the feminist movement. Estelle Hamburger, <laughs> which is a great name, 
by the way, who is a fashion consultant in New York City. She wrote a lot of books about the fashion industry, quoted about the fashion group that it was not a woman's movement, but a movement of women who held jobs for which they had been chosen by men because women would be likely to know more about women's clothing than men. So in short, they wanted to be taken seriously because they were good at their jobs, they were skilled at their jobs, and not just because they were women. This point is further exemplified by an article in Fortune magazine in 1935 talking about um, a list of successful business people at the time, and women were not included on this list, and specifically women in the fashion and beauty industries. They gave two reasons for this. One was that women were less likely to be involved in vital industries, things like railroads and construction. And two, uh, I'm going to quote it because it is shockingly harsh. Uh, Fortune magazine did not regularly publish such strong opinions in these types of pieces, but quote, I'm going to read this to you from my computer. Um, so the second reason is that feminine success in the exploitation of women proves nothing but the fact that women are by nature feminine. The difference is not merely that women meet less male competition in their own acreage. The difference is that success in style designing or in the sale of cosmetics or in the publicizing of women's wear implies little or nothing as to those activities in which womanhood is not a natural advantage. It gets better. Elizabeth Arden is not a potential Henry Ford. She is Elizabeth Arden. It is a career in itself, but it is not a career in industry. Elizabeth Arden and her kind, in other words, are not professional women. They are women by profession. So basically here, uh, this article is saying three things. Oh, sorry, there goes my light. So the article is saying three things. One is that women uh, are not included in this list because in these industries, they don't have to compete with men. So that means their success competing with other women is not valid. Uh, number two, oh, we have a guest. Come on. Okay. Yep. Get comfy. Oh, hello. Are you just sitting? Are you gonna lie down? So, I don't even remember what I was talking about. So that women were not included on this list because they don't have to compete with men. Two is that women are only good at fashion because they are women, and so naturally they understand the entire fashion industry. From design, to marketing, to production. Well, actually, production is not something that women were involved in. Manufacturing was still largely controlled by men at the time, so they weren't even really including that as part of the um, industry non-vital industry that women were involved in. Number three, what this article is saying is that fashion is not important anyways, um, and these beauty industries are not important anyways. And I think a lot of these factors we often still, we often still deal with today, um, especially a lot of women who are involved in different types of beauty therapies, fashion designing. Um, it can sometimes feel really hard to be taken seriously. I've even experienced this a little bit myself with my fledgling little business baby. Uh, one thing that this article doesn't mention is any of the men that uh, these women were actually competing with. So Elizabeth Arden was competing with men who owned and ran companies like Max Factor um, and Charles Revson as well. So they were competing with men in all of the male owned and led design houses that women were competing with as well. They just conveniently forgot that point. An amazing quote by Rebecca Arnold who wrote the book the American Look, the source I'm getting a lot of this information from, she says it also demonstrates by its very exclusion just how hard it was for women to be taken seriously inside a 
feminine industry and in the wider business world. Also, Rebecca Arnold, thank you so much for writing this book. If you're watching this, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So the fashion group basically had a few different initiatives. They met together regularly and they would have talks. And they would have talks from people ranging from fashion experts, visiting designers, or couturiers from France to keep them updated on what was happening in French fashion because at the time that was very, very important. They also received talks from, I believe, politicians, things like psychology and marketing, consumer behavior, anything that they thought would um, enhance their knowledge of, of pop culture and society in regards to their industry. There was even once a discussion of sweatshop labor. And according to Rebecca Arnold's book, the records that they do have of these men who would come and give talks on these various topics apparently felt really awkward being in the presence of such powerful women because a lot of these women were editors of large publications, presidents of department stores, so apparently it is reflected in the manuscripts or the transcripts of these talks. In 1935 they started introducing the Fashion Futures shows where they would do reports on current trends and kind of begin trend forecasting to help progress one another's businesses so it wasn't like they were trying to keep all of these secrets for their one design house they were actually sharing this information amongst the entire industry in New York the fashion group even before World War II they were pushing for America to become a fashion power so at the time French fashion was where it was at French designs had complete prominence over any other type of design and American fashions were seen were seen as kind of maybe uh, like cheap copies or kind of I get the sense that it was even seen as kind of like pokey and not really the real thing. So they had been pushing for New York to be one of these fashion centers because it was already a growing center for mass manufacturing of clothing because during the Great Depression um, they had to start manufacturing clothing more cheaply and efficiently to keep their customers, um, to keep providing customers with affordable clothing throughout the Great Depression. So they were already building the system which contributed to uh, New York later becoming a successful ready-to-wear center. So during World War II, when France was occupied by the Germans and Paris was occupied by the Germans, obviously there were no fashions coming out of France at that time. So they, not that they took advantage of a global crisis for their benefit, but they really saw that this was the moment for American designers and American fashions to step up and assert themselves as an independent source of fashion and design. So they began through publications, through marketing and merchandising at department stores, really associating American designs and designers with the sense of patriotism, which was obviously quite a binding sentiment during World War II. So they really were able to capture this and associate it with American fashion, which in the end, after World War II, was done so successfully that they were able to establish and maintain New York with this sense of the American look and center of American fashion. This was done alongside of many other tactics, not just the sense of patriotism, but in the end they were, as we can see today, successful in installing New York as the fashion capital that it is today. And this wasn't all the fashion group was up to during the war. On March 1st, 1942, Vogue published a speech by Edna Woolman Chase given to the fashion group talking about the role the fashion group played in the war effort. So she says, We are looked to, you and I, in our special capacity as working women and as leaders in a tremendous industry by thousands of businessmen, great and small by hundreds of thousands of people working in those businesses and by millions of other women all over America for whom it is our duty to provide some kind of leadership, some kind of code, some kind of advice, and even in a sense, some kind of wartime dress etiquette. 
Fashions do not die because of wars. Many of the best of them are created by war's necessities. They could not be fashions if they did not conform to the spirit and the needs and the restrictions of the current times. I have noticed that in some quarters since America entered the war, there are people in the fashion business who seem almost to feel apologetic for the very term fashion. They think perhaps that any talk of fashion is too trivial for days as dark as these. All of a sudden, they find themselves acting and sounding and even feeling a little ashamed at their jobs. All of a sudden, everyone around us seems to be doing something vital and important. When they ask us of the fashion industry what we do, a peculiar defensive note creeps into our voices. We wonder, will they think we're frittering our time away on non-essential while the world is in flames? We're not at all sure that it's very justifiable or worthwhile to be in the fashion business at this particular moment in the world's history. Well, I suppose there is some basis for worrying about this. Fashion has been guilty of plenty of absurdities in the past. Lots of people haven't been able to tell the fashions from the follies, and lots of people haven't cared. The more silly and chi-chi, the more fun to wear it just for the fun of it. Well, there is going to be less of that. Today we want to take the folly out of fashion, but not the charm, the taste, and the becomingness. We shall have to begin to think more about value now, real value, the greatest value we can possibly give. Yes, we shall want plenty of beauty, but we can do with very little folly. So the fashion group still exists, and I believe they have hundreds or even thousands of members today. Um, you can even visit their website, which I will link down below. And I would like to go through and just talk a little bit about some of the founding members of the fashion group and show you some photos of them. I can't get photos of all of them because either they are copyrighted or I could not find any original photographs of them. So we'll talk about some of the editors first of these fashion publications. Winifred Ovit, who was the editor of Women's Wear Daily. She served as president of the fashion group for a time. We have Edna Woolman Chase, the editor of Vogue magazine. Carmel Snow, who was the editor of Harper's Bazaar magazine. Dorothy Shaver, who was was to become the first female president of a department store of the prestigious Lord and Taylor department store in New York City. One of my personal heroes. There's this amazing photograph of her sitting at a table full of men and a few women, um, but she is there at the head of the table as the president of the department store and I love it. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt was included in this group and at the time she was the first lady of New York, um, as well as several fashion designers at the time. So we had Claire McCardle, Claire Potter, um, Elizabeth Hawes, Edith Head, the famous Hollywood costume designer, and then we have women like Elizabeth Arden, uh, who was part of this group, and as well as Helena Rubinstein, and I'm not sure I'm saying that name correctly, but she actually was um, the inventor of tube mascara. And Virginia Pope, who I only just recently started reading about, and she is a fascinating person. So, so, so she wrote for, I think it was the New York Times, and was kind of one of the first journalists to start writing about fashion seriously and the fashion business, not just little snippets about what things were trendy, but kind of talking and writing about the fashion industry as a whole. So I hope you've enjoyed this little snippet of learning about the fashion group. These women are incredibly inspirational to me, and had they not achieved what they achieved, we wouldn't be where we are today. They were a group of badass business babes. Babes supporting babes. I just love it. I just love it. It probably seems a very silly thing to get emotional about. But I, I think because of my own experience now, trying to start my own business, having this little network that I have personally of other women um, starting their own businesses. I just know how much that has affected me. I'm not crying, you're crying. I hope you learned a little something from this video, and more than anything else, I hope it inspires you to do that. And more than anything, I hope it inspires you to go out and support a babe. I think that lifting each other up is always the way to go. There's plenty of room at the table. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Support your friends. Don't tear them down. 
Give them some love. Yes. <laughs>